Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What's shaking? I hope you are having an amazing day. My morning has been fantastic because I have been getting ready to release this podcast, which I am sure you will all be blown away by. I had the opportunity recently to hang out with my buddy, Tommy Wood, again. Hanging out with Tommy Wood is like drinking from a fire hose. I always learn so much. I appreciate him immensely. You guys know him from the previous episode in which we discussed all sorts of wide-ranging things. You should refer to that one. The title uh, of the podcast is The Blue Zones Are a Myth. That's the original podcast I did with Tommy. And incidentally, since we recorded that podcast, a new paper was published which continued to substantiate the notion that the Blue Zones are, in fact, a myth. And Tommy texted me after we did this podcast and said, I can't believe I didn't mention that paper in this podcast, but I will talk more about that paper soon. Basically, that paper suggested that most of the Blue Zones are places where people do not record their birth dates very well, and so many of the ideas of supercentenarians may in fact be fraudulent. So that is interesting, but that is in reference to the previous podcast. This podcast, we just laid it down. Tommy just dropped bombs. I've had so many questions about ApoE4 in relation to Alzheimer's, in relation to the amyloid hypothesis, in relation to ketogenic and carnivore diets. And as you will hear on this podcast, we really worked hard to delineate what ApoE4 is, what the different cells in the brain are, how this is connected with lipid metabolism, how this is connected with the amyloid hypothesis, and why you probably don't need to worry about an ApoE4 isoform on a ketogenic or carnivore diet if you're insulin sensitive and why that flies in the face of mainstream thinking and why mainstream thinking is, as usual, myopic and overly focused on LDL and cholesterol and overly directed by epidemiologic studies, which really are not mechanistic and cannot give us good data. You guys will know Tommy from the previous podcast. His bio is out of this world. He calls himself an elite level professional nerd, and that's that's reasonable. He's definitely elite level in many, many ways. He has an undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Cambridge. He has a medical degree from the University of Oxford and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo, which makes him a doctor, doctor, double doctor. He's currently a research assistant professor at the University of Washington, which is where I was fortunate to connect with him originally, and a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition. He also jokingly refers to himself sometimes as the chief snake officer at the Costa Rican Center for Bro Research. If you listen to the first podcast that we did, you will hear his amazing story of getting bitten by one of the most venomous snakes in the world, a fur de lance, and surviving it, and now kicking an amazing amount of butt. He says at the end of this podcast, his current goal is to become as big and strong as possible. And I think he's well on his way. So he was amazing. This podcast is out of this world. And another thing that was out of this world recently for me was that I got to hang out with people from Ancestral Supplements. Listen, you guys, like it is so interesting to meet the people behind supplements and We know that podcasts don't usually pay for themselves, so we have to be sponsored. But from the beginning, I've always felt like the guys at Ancestral Supplements were such good people. And honestly, this company is perhaps more consistent with my brand than any other company I can imagine. You will all know that I am so interested and supportive of people eating the whole animal, eating nose to tail. In fact, last night I was at a restaurant with Drew Canoli from Organifi, Ben Greenfield, and uh, my new friend, Mike Bledsoe from Barbell Shrugged. And I brought all kinds of cool organ meats. We ate testicle, we ate 
uh, Iberian beef fat, all these kinds of things. And the awesome thing about ancestral supplements is they make all of these organs accessible to everyone. You can eat testicle, you can eat brain, you can eat all these things now in convenient capsules and they're sourced from grass fed animals in New Zealand. These guys are meticulous about where the organ meats come from. This episode of the podcast is about Alzheimer's disease and the brain. So it only makes sense that I would tell you about their brain supplement. I love this one. My family appreciates this one. I have a really, really cute one and a half year old niece who uh, I have encouraged my sister to give the brain supplement to. It is desiccated, which is so it's low temperature dehydrated brain, which preserves all of these crucial factors in the brain. It preserves the DHA and the EPA and all of these neurotrophic factors in the brain, which will support our own brains. I've eaten real brain, but it's very hard for me to access. It's probably very hard for most of you to access, but I love eating the low temperature dehydrated, the desiccated organ supplements from Ancestral, and especially the brain at all times in my life. And I do think that there are neurotrophic factors in there, which will help and encourage the growth of new neurons. There's a molecule called sphingomyelin, which plays a central role in the myelin sheath and cell signaling. But from an ancestral perspective, it is so consistent to eat brain. This is something our ancestors would have treasured perhaps above anything else. And I am so appreciative that Ancestral Supplements will offer this to us because so many of us don't actually want to eat a brain or can't access it, and I can't travel with brain. So I am eating it every day now, and I think you guys will really appreciate this. You can go to ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. They are putting back in what the modern world has left out. I appreciate that about them. And if you go to their Shopify site, you can use the code SALADINOMD for 10% off, and they will know that I sent you or that I gave some sort of a recommendation. But I got to have dinner with these guys. They are such good people. They are just good people who care about all of us and want people to be healthy, and they are making a product, and I think they are filling an important need in the space at this time. So with that in mind, on to the podcast, no more ado. This was kind of a long intro. I apologize for that, but you guys, I think, will really, really like this podcast. Listen at the end of the podcast if you want to hear more about what's going on with me. I'm trying to put more of that stuff at the end of the podcast rather than just a canned recorded thing, but on to the podcast with Tommy Wood. Prepare to have your minds blown. Let me know what you think of this one. You guys, I loved it. Tommy Wood, welcome hey. to the show. Uh, thanks for having me back. It's good to have you back, my friend. I think that we are starting a trend right now. I recorded a podcast with Ben Greenfield over the weekend, and we were shirtless on his balcony, and now you and I are, you're not shirtless, but I'm shirtless, <laughs> sitting in the, the sun. sun. The sun on the guns. Yeah, we're getting sun on the guns. You were, uh, you were chastising me as I walked through Ancestral Health Symposium shirtless, but I thought that's very primal. It's so. very it's very paleo. I'm sorry that I conformed to modern societal dress codes when you were in fact much more paleo than me at the time so that's I was, my bad i was crushing you with my ancestral wisdom <laughs> as i walked through ahs without a shirt it was a short it was a short sojourn across the ahs conference to get to you but i'm excited to talk to you today because perhaps more than anyone else i've had on the podcast in the past i appreciate your um deep dives into many of these scientific themes and one of the things that we have talked about a little bit in the past is dementia and mm, Alzheimer's. Yeah. And a lot of times people will ask me questions about APOE4. And yeah. I want to break this down for people. And so we'll set the background, we'll make the context, and then we'll kind of dig into the research here and give people a sense of what the heck this is. But let's just start with a discussion perhaps of what the heck we're talking about when we're saying APOE4. What does it even mean why do people worry about it from your perspective? Sure. So APOE4 is one of the apolipoproteins. So people will have heard probably of APOA1. That's the main lipoprotein on HDL particles. Um, APOB, so that's LDL particles. Uh, maybe C3, that's one of the ones sort of... Um, particularly associated maybe with longevity heart disease risk because it affects like the circulation time of your LDL particles. Um, and so APOE is another lipoprotein that helps transport cholesterol and it's made, you know, so particularly when people are worried about dementia, it's made in the brain, helps transport uh, cholesterol through the brain. Um, and we have three different 
types, three different you know phenotype or genotypes would create three different structural versions of ApoE. So uh, ApoE two, ApoE three, and ApoE four, and they're they're sort of um, different in it, along our evolutionary path. So ApoE four was actually the most recent one. Supposedly, when we came when we came down out of the trees, uh, we were much more likely to step on something and say injure our feet. That's kind of like the you know. The, the popular version, but basically we had a greater in we had a greater trauma and infection risk. And ApoE4 is actually protective for that. It actually helps. It does a huge number of things modulating the immune system, modulating the immune response, and it seems to be beneficial in that setting. So it may have been a survival advantage due to the, its effects on the immune system. However, um, when we then start talking about dementia, um, ApoE4 is probably you know is one of the few real genetic risk factors for dementia that we actually that we can take seriously so there's a lot of associational nonsense bapo e4 certainly the risk factors seem to be you know at least worth talking about so if you have one copy um your risk has increased maybe two to three times particularly in caucasians and asians not so much or at all in hispanics and african americans um or people of african origin african descent um and then if you have two copies, it's maybe like five times that, so ten to twenty percent, something like that. Um, and that, so that's why people are, are, are getting, you know, pretty worked up about it. And the, so, if you're going to get Alzheimer's disease, maybe by the time you're seventy or eighty years old, if you have two Apo E four uh, copies um, and you live in the Western world, you probably probably have about a ninety percent chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So the majority of people who have Alzheimer's disease don't have ApoE4 just because it's less common. Um, but you know, if, if particularly if you're going to live a long life in the environment that we live in, it certainly seems to be a significant risk factor. And that statement holds so much. That is that is the statement that we will unpack yeah. in detail on this podcast. If you're going to added live a, a long big life, caveat there on yes, purpose. Yes, that, and I just want to emphasize that caveat. If you live a long life, living the way that most Westerners live, yeah, exactly. and that's what we'll explore. Before we dig into that, I just want to make sure people understand what we're talking about because when I first started looking at this, the concept of apolipoproteins was confusing to me. So let's just give people a little bit of background here. So what we're talking about with apolipoproteins are actually apoE is a protein. Mm -hmm. It's composed of amino acids. I think it's like 230 amino acids. And there are various polymorphisms throughout the apoE protein. And I think that the two polymorphic locations are 112 and 157. Somebody's perhaps. been doing his homework. I did a little homework before this podcast. <laughs> but there are, there are certain amino acids in the sequence of apoE, which is a protein that can become polymorphic. And this is what determines whether we have ApoE2, ApoE3, or ApoE4. Now, when we are, I think it's confusing for people when they hear apolipoprotein, but mm -hmm. I'll try and clarify this for people. What we're talking about with apolipoproteins, whether it's ApoA1, ApoB48, ApoB100, or ApoC3, these are essentially proteins that get inserted into lipid, lipoprotein particles. Mm -hmm. And lipoprotein particles are like these single... Uh, single membrane spheres of which LDL is a particle, right? VLDL, yeah. LDL, HDL, chylomicrons. So I like people to think of them as, uh, as, as balls, as like, you know, single membrane balls. Rather than a cell, which has a double lipid bilayer, these are single lipid layer uh, spherical particles which mm -hmm. hold things in the interior which are not soluble in water. Yeah. So they, the, the phospholipid monolayer on the outside of the lipoproteins is sort of this magical way that our body can make something that's water soluble or excuse me lipid soluble like cholesterol or triglycerides soluble in an aqueous medium like blood yeah. and into that membrane get inserted these apolipoproteins so it's sort of like a uh, a sphere with these like these proteins inserted into the membrane and those can be all sorts of things there are apolipoproteins like we said a b c3 apo apolipoprotein e so it's a protein in a membrane of a sort of lipoprotein sphere transporting things in the body is that yeah reasonable is that yeah that's, would that's you exact, add anything to that no i think that that's that's exactly it that's, and that's and that the reason why you have it is for that exact reason because you have these you know cholesterol lipid um lipid molecules that aren't gonna, that you can't transport in blood because they're not water soluble and so then you need some kind of um, uh, Dave Feldman calls them boats or rafts, and that's you know that that's essentially what they're there for. It's almost like a spaceship, uh, a boat or a raft. You know that it's kind of not fully encla encased, but 
I, I love Dave's metaphor. I think it's accurate. And I, the only thing I would add to that is it's encasing these things completely so they can become soluble. Yeah. And into that, we have this incredible, incredibly elegant system in the human body. Into those spaceships or boats are inserted different tags, which are apolipoproteins, which help our body know what's in the spaceship and where it should be going. Yeah. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. So yeah. we won't go into a ton of detail about ApoB, ApoA1. You mentioned it briefly. ApoA1 is the apolipoprotein that identifies HDL particles in a, in a general sense. Yeah, yeah. And ApoB would can, can be either ApoB48 on chylomicrons or ApoB100 on LDL, LDL particles. LDL yeah. particles. Yeah. And as you mentioned, ApoC3 is an interesting one. That's a whole other podcast. And it gets, like, it gets moved around and transferred and turned on and off. And it, These yeah. tags can get moved yeah. around yeah, between yeah. particles. It's quite fascinating. One of the interesting things that I learned recently about ApoC3 as an aside is that ApoC3 is increased in states of insulin resistance. Yeah. And, that, and that ApoC3 on the outside of LDL particles may make them more likely to be retained in the subendothelial space. I think yeah. I was so excited about learning that that I sent you the paper. Yeah. And, and you were like, oh, yeah, I know that. And I was like, <laughs> that's usually what happens when I send Tommy papers. He's like, oh, yeah, let me show you this one. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, at least I'm on the right track. But Tommy's way ahead of me all the time. But I thought that was such an interesting finding that, that some of these apolipoproteins on the lipoprotein molecules can affect residence times or at least even in the case of LDL, how avidly LDL could be retained in the subendothelial and space. And ApoE4 does, can do the same thing, can interfere with LDL receptors so that you get a longer residence time for LDL. In, in the circulation. Yeah. And so that's, that maybe brings us to the next piece, that these apolipoproteins on the surface of these spheres on the surface of these spaceships, they interact with receptors, yeah. right? And that's how the body docks with, that's how the body knows where the spaceship should go or the boat should go. And in the case of ApoB, it interacts with the LDL receptor. Mm. And I've also read that ApoE can interact with the LDL yeah. receptor in yeah. some spaces. And so what you're talking about with residence time is the way that these the way that these molecules on the surface of the LDL particle, or excuse me, the way that these molecules on the surface of lipoprotein particles, not necessarily, could, it's usually LDL, but other ones too, yeah. are interacting with their receptors and moving throughout the body. Yeah. Yep. And cool. the, it's something that uh, we think about in terms of uh, risk of cardiovascular disease, because it seems that if, you have a, if your LDL particle hangs around for longer, it's more likely to be modified, which may make it more problematic. However... You know, re uh, reverse causation is also possible, which is that if you have insulin resistance, all these other things happen that make your LDL particles reside longer. And then those are the things that end up being that that are actually causative in atherosclerosis. And then the LDL particle residence time is just kind of like along for the ride. I don't think we know the answer either way, but it's certainly possible that you have re reverse causation. And that is another <laughs> that is another action packed statement that you said right there. <laughs> so we'll just repeat that and unpack it for one moment. So I, I want to emphasize what Tommy is saying here, that traditionally, or many people would think or seek to suggest that the main problem with LDL is when there's more LDL, you get larger residence times, or if, there's, if the LDL is hanging around in the circulation longer, it's more likely to become oxidized, and, and that that is how atherosclerosis happens. Yeah. But there is an alternative paradigm, and I, the word you use or the words you use there are very important and nuanced, which are reverse causality or reverse causation. Yeah. And in the first podcast we did, we talked about reverse causation with regard to TMAO, yeah. uh, trimethylamine oxide. And for people who did not listen to that podcast, TMAO is a molecule that is widely maligned because an association, an epidemiologic association with diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And what seems to be coming out of the TMAO story is that it's not the TMAO itself that is causing those conditions. It's those conditions that are causing TMAO to be high. Yeah. And so to the casual observer from the outside, you see cardiovascular disease high and TMAO high. And the the mistake that many people in the scientific community are making, I would say prematurely, is saying, oh, TMAO causes atherosclerosis, yeah. right? This is why Stephen Gundry and a lot of people want their TMAO to be low and why molecules that may raise TMAO like choline and carnitine are vilified. Or eating fish. Or eating fish, right? Yeah. Or vegetables. <laughs> yeah. This is where the theory starts to break down yeah, with TMAO, yeah. right? Uh -huh. that, that vegetables can raise your TMAO, that fish has 40 times more preformed TMAO than you'd get from an equivalent amount of choline and carnitine in the same amount of meat. Yeah. 
And so this is the same thing happening with LDL in this situation, that just because LDL is around longer and perhaps more oxidized doesn't mean that that's the main thing going on here. It could all be due to the insulin resistance, which is causing LDL to have a longer residence time, and we can talk about why that might be the case. Yeah. And as my oversimplified thing, if I just cut to the chase here, would be that insulin resistance is the main bad guy. Yeah, if you have met, I mean, any, anything that where you have like metabolic disease, right? All of this stuff is happening. And so then being able to pick one thing and say, oh yeah, that's the thing that's the problem. It doesn't make any sense. However, I will, like, this is where I always like to think about the population in which you're doing these studies, right? So if everybody is insulin resistant and more than probably 90% of the American adult population have some degree, they're on, they're on the, uh, you know, the sliding scale of insulin resistance and metabolic disease. If everybody is insulin resistant or has metabolic health problems, then single things will pop up. So then yes, maybe because if you, if you're insulin resistant, maybe having more LDL is bad because it does go into, you know, pain or pressure points in the, in the circulation, which are more damaged and cause atherosclerosis there. But if that metabolic disease isn't there in the first place, you know, maybe it's maybe it's not a problem at all. But when you're doing these studies in uh, a sick population where the endothelium is already completely screwed on the other line of your blood vessels, then some of this stuff starts to look like it's important. But that's just because, you know, everybody's sick in the first place. That is such an important thing to note that 85 percent of the population perhaps has metabolic disease. Yeah. I think that if we did fasting insulin and perhaps later in the podcast or in the podcast I'm going to do with Nathan, we can talk about the best markers to look at insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. But I, I agree with you that if we looked at the general population, a staggering amount of the general population would be insulin resistant. Yeah. So it was, uh, they, they just used some, some NHANES data to look at this stuff. They said 82.4% had at least one of like the, the stages towards metabolic syndrome. But that, so for instance, but they had, they had fairly lenient cutoffs. So their cutoff for poor glucose regulation was 100 milligrams per deciliter fasting glucose. We already know it's too late. By the time your, fa your, your fasting glucose is above 100 milligrams per deciliter, you're already in trouble. Um, so, you know, I, I think that if they, if they improved their cutoffs, um, it would be even more than that. Did they have anything in there for fasting insulin? No, they didn't. So they just used the metabolic syndrome um, criteria so it's waist circumference um hdl fasting glucose obesity blood um, pressure blood pressure yeah yeah interesting so this is something that i want people to understand that if you're studying a population of whom the vast majority is sick it's very hard to tease out what is causing it yeah and things may look like risk factors because the insulin resistance is affecting all of those things yeah exactly and that is perhaps the biggest takeaway. We haven't even gotten into the meat of this podcast and you guys are getting bombs dropped on you. So have you seen, have you seen the YouTube video from David Foster Wallace, his uh, commencement address at Kenyon this College? This is water. This is water. Yeah. Anyone who's listening to this podcast should go listen to that talk. It's not entirely relevant, but I think about it from that perspective. In the talk, David Foster Wallace re sort of relates this this truism or this parable of fish swimming around in the ocean and it's a young fish. It's two young fish and they're swimming around and they're cruising around having a good day and they see an old fish and the old fish goes, Hey boys, how's the water? And one of the fishes looks at the other fish and goes, what's the water? What's water? You know, what, what is water? And they don't even know. And the point that David Foster Wallace is making in that interview is that our consciousness is always evolving and we're sort of, we are, we are working in water all the time and our life is happening to us in the moment. I'm not doing a great job of explaining this, but he will do a much better, more poetic job. The takeaway that I had from that video is that it's important to be mindful and in the moments when we find ourselves stressed at waiting in traffic or in the grocery line, we should remember that this is the experience of our life happening to us in every moment. That's not super relevant to our, my conversation with Tommy, but what is is just the idea that this is water. That if everyone is bathing in the same water, if everyone is in the same milieu... If the water is insulin resistance. If right. the water is insulin resistance, <laughs> then that makes all of the studies that we're doing look a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. And that's, exactly. that's the reason I thought of it. And I apologize for my butchering of David Foster Wallace's theme. You should all go listen to that as well. So I love that we're getting to this so early in the conversation. And as you and I had talked about a little bit earlier in the month or last month, uh, 
insulin resistance can affect all sorts of things with LDL in addition to APOC3. It can also affect the proteoglycan layer and the subendothelium. That was another thing I sent you and I was like, oh, I'm so excited about yeah, this. Yeah. I'll do a whole other podcast about that, you guys. It's not what I want to talk about today. But the idea that insulin resistance could be driving the ability of LDL or the propensity of LDL to become retained in the subendothelial layer is a fascinating hypothesis. Yeah, and I think when you're, when you're, you, when you're looking at you know, the, these these studies, you you see that before. So so there's a so say that for example, there are a number of studies looking at autopsies of people, right? And so you can like see this, um, see the atherosclerosis happening in real in real time, and and well, these are dead people, so it's not in real time. It's deceased people's but better words. But, it's, but it's, you can kind of see the the pro- the progression of the pathology, if you want to call it that, and when. <clears throat> Before you get any retention of LDL into the subendothelial space, you get expansion of the extracellular matrix and the smooth muscle cells within the intima. And what seems to be driving those changes are things associated with insulin resistance, so like high insulin levels, um, high homocysteine levels. I mean, you know, homocysteine is elevated homocysteine is a risk factor for um, for cardiovascular disease so there's all these metabolic changes that occur first they alter the structure of the endothelium which then increases the retention of the ldl particles of course at the same time you've 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 screwed the glycoc so glycoc the glycocalyx which is basically like this this slippery glycoprotein layer that's so that lines your arteries and just like makes you have nice smooth uh, laminar flow through that is you know really you know you damage it with large swings in blood glucose for instance so like and that's what's protecting that first layer of cells so at the same time you're increasing uh the permeability of this layer and then underneath it you're increasing the the protein structure that's going to retain these things and all of that happens all of that happens first um and then you get to the part where maybe you're, you're getting some alteration of the LDL particles themselves different proteins changes in the LDL receptor in terms of number and function and then that's going to increase your residence time too but you 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 require all these metabolic impairments first before those things start to happen. What Tommy just said, I hope will go down in history <laughs> as a game changing idea because you guys should like rewind the podcast and just listen to that because that is a fantastic explanation of the alternative hypothesis yeah. of what's going on with lipids and atherosclerosis. And it's worth it. And like, I'll repeat again, if, if you are studying lipidology in a sick population then LDL particle all of a sudden looks super important because everybody's endothelium is already screwed but if you were to to look at this in a population where that isn't the case um, then I don't think you don't see the same association but it's because of the population in which it's being studied then it does make sense right if you could like drop your LDL particle in the setting of a really screwed endothelium you might see benefit absolutely but maybe you should just have a healthy endothelium in the first place and then you don't have to worry about it exactly if your entire population is sick if you're all in the hot water of insulin resistance everything looks different and maybe that doesn't apply to those of us on ketogenic carnivore diets or even those of us who are on paleolithic diets with some carbohydrates who are insulin sensitive yeah absolutely and that my friends is the major takeaway from most of my work in general beyond this podcast <laughs> that is an overarching theme that that we should not be vilified we should not be criticized we should not be worried about many of the things that are told to us as uh, very dangerous because they are from the context of a very sick population. And it's nuanced. Yeah. And it takes a lot of scientific knowledge to sort of delineate this. And that's what we're hoping to achieve here and help yeah. people understand that these are not all the same situation. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's go back to APOE. So APOE is one of these apoliproteins. It has different roles in the periphery and in the CNS. And we're going to get to the role of APOE in the CNS. But any sense of what APOE is doing in the periphery? Cholesterol transport, right? Yeah, so Some kind of signaling. Yeah, involved in cholesterol transport, but again, I think its its major benefit is there is 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 an immunological one. And so we were talking very briefly. Nathan was was reeling off all the di- all the different potential functions of ApoE four in the immune system in terms of regulating T cells and different cytokines. And like I said, I think it's a it's a beneficial adaptation, particularly in people who have a high um, infection burden. And we can probably talk about that in terms of uh, uh, dementia risk as well. So. That's so. It is involved in lipid transport, like that's where we've classified it. But I think most of the, like most of its effects that are really different from the other versions of of ApoE, um, it is in terms of immune modulation. Are you saying that lipoproteins serve an immunologic role? 
Oh, that I may be hinting towards that. Maybe that's maybe that's important. Yeah, we may get there. So I've talked about another that another podcast as well, but this is a recapitulation of the idea that lipoproteins such as LDL have very well known immunologic function and HDL too. HDL, yeah. right? And that uh, to universally vilify these molecules as some may do. Yeah. At least ignores those those functions. Yeah, and and that's what some of the the nicest work on uh, familial hypercholesterolemia suggests that yes, um, in certain scenarios, again in the setting of insulin resistance, um, your elevated LDL and total cholesterol in familial hypercholesterolemia is associated when you're young with an increased relative risk of um, of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks. But when you when you're older, and particularly if you're not insulin resistant, you actually you're um, protected against particularly infections, which becomes a real risk for uh, for health as as you get old as you get older. So it actually helps you live l- at least as long, if not longer, because you have that protective effect via the life proteins. And this is in people with familial hypercholesterolemia. In people with familial hypercholesterolemia. And I know that there are multiple studies looking at people who do not have familial hypercholesterolemia stratifying those in terms of total mortality or all-cause mortality or longevity with uh, levels of LDL cholesterol. And they see the same – I think it might have been total cholesterol depending whether we're talking about Leiden 85 or some of these other epidemiologic studies. But in the elderly – there's great evidence, even in the elderly who do not have familial yeah. hypercholesterol, yeah. there's great evidence that higher levels of LDL are protective. Yeah, there's this really nice study, the, the Inchianti study, which is a, a longevity study looking at older populations in Italy. And they, tra- they stratified people by um, high and low HDL and LDL and the combinations of them. And they, they showed that the, lo- the longest lived people were, were people with normal HDL and high LDL. So it was an LDL above 130. And then like... You should just read the abstract because they tie themselves in knots trying to trying to describe why lower LDL is still better even though they had a survival advantage in those who higher LDL. So like the the cognitive dissonance is just is just incredible. Where because you see this in and um, so Malcolm Kendrick um, is a, a Scottish physician in the UK and he's I mean he's done so much work on this kind of stuff. He's he's published with guys like Uffi Rafskoff and they published a paper on LDL and survival. Uh, all cause mortality in uh, in the elderly, particularly. So, if if you want to be old, right, watching, you're making sure that your your cholesterol isn't dropping is probably important. And again, there may be because there are other diseases that you might get that decrease your cholesterol, like certain cancers, and that might be part of the association. But it's certainly not going to make you drop dead. Um, you know, those people who are surviving for a long time seem to have higher higher cholesterol levels. And we. Uh, I think I may have mentioned on the last podcast, we've been producing some morta- mortality models from the NHANES data. Um, me and the other guys who do the, the who make the blood calculator, so Chris Kelly and Megan Roberts and Brian Walsh. And what we found is that there's a different, there's, if, you, if you build a model to predict how old somebody is, higher cholesterol, higher total cholesterol, like predicts an older person. But that doesn't that that prediction of being older doesn't correlate with an increased prediction of mortality so there are some things that you you want to happen as you get older that are associated with living longer and an increase in cholesterol is one of those things again flying in the face of the notion that <laughs> That LDL is directly toxic to the endothelium, yeah. which I think is integral to the response to retention hypothesis that mainstream lipidology espouses. Yeah. And that is something that I will talk about in more detail on future podcasts. But I think that that notion is perhaps the biggest differentiating factor in the way that, that I and I believe you think about LDL and the way that the rest of the world thinks about LDL. I think most lipidologists believe the LDL to be directly toxic to the endothelium. And, I, and, it, and so in vitro, it can be, right? You can model it and show that it, that it can be. But again, you have to think about the setting in which you're studying these things. And so again, in a, in a, in a sick population, it may well double down on the endothelial damage that you've already caused. But in the absence of that disease, you know, I think you're going to see something very different. So exactly. it's all about the system in which you're studying these things. Context is everything. Yeah. This is water. What water <laughs> are you in, right? Yeah. Are you in a murky pool of insulin resistance or are you in a clean ocean with amazing waves? <laughs> where I hope to be at some point in the near future, perhaps on my foil board. All right, so in the periphery, APOE is doing those things yeah. and has immunologic roles. What about in the brain? Let's move to the brain. So now we're moving out of the periphery, across the blood-brain barrier, into the central nervous system. Let's talk about APOE a little bit in the central nervous system. Yeah, and 
so it obviously has very similar roles and it, your, your brain makes its own cholesterol right it's not generated in the periphery and transported across most of it is synthesized in situ as we'd say so it's synthesized in the brain from precursors such as ketones or glucose um they create the backbone and then it has to be moved around so apoe is mainly made in the astrocytes um and maybe in the microglia and then it's it's absorbed or the receptor is on the on the neuron so it's being used to shuttle um lipids and cholesterol you know through the brain from where it's synthesized to the neurons which are then going to use it to you know make their membranes or or you know synthesize precursors so the neurons are looking for cholesterol as fuel. They're yeah. seeing this as a very good thing. In- incredibly important structural um, structural molecule like to, to ensure the integrity of your cell membranes. And this is uh, like one of my one of my pet things, which is um, which I think is super important is ketones, particularly for the developing brain. And right. that's because ketones are the preferred precursor for cholesterol synthesis in the developing brain and you and and fatty acid th- synthesis as well so you're you're like the young brain sucks these things up and it's because it's growing so rapidly it needs and the same if you have an injury or you know if you're trying to turn over cells and replace them or grow new cells like you might want to be when you're older and increase the size of your hippocampus so that you don't get dementia um you know all of that requires synthesis um of new cells and new membranes and that you know cholesterol is essential for that and so one of the observations that has been made is that kids go in ketosis very quickly. Yeah. And yeah, and far faster than adults. And I mean, in in, ba- in newborn babies, they're basically guaranteed to be in ketosis for at least the first week of life because either the mother isn't producing any breast milk, um, so they'll immediately they're immediately fasting and they're immediately essentially immediately produce ketones, or there are medium chain triglycerides in the breast milk that will then cause ketosis, like it would in any of us who take like MCT oil or something. So basically, the newborn baby regardless of what happens it has to be in ketosis it's just an essential part of brain development again we're just dro- tommy's dropping bombs you guys it's amazing <laughs> and the other thing you said that i want to highlight is that glucose and ketones are made into cholesterol yeah we had spoken about this a little bit on the first podcast you were not surprised when we had talked about increasing levels of ldl reflective of higher levels of total cholesterol in the body on ketogenic diets because of the shared pathway of ketones and cholesterol, or ketones being used to make cholesterol in the periphery and in the brain through acetyl CoA and the mevalonate pathway. Yeah, and that could be, and that could be, yeah, and so they sh- the the beginning of the pathway is 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 shared, and it, it, I mean that could be one of the reasons why, you know, so if you do have decreased circulating glucose or less glucose is coming in then you're not going to have those precursors for synthesis so then you know ketones like take over part of that role so then they're not just used as fuel they're incredibly important for for um you know generating new molecules um to like to be the backbones of those things and so if you have less glucose then ketones take over that role and that it's not just metabolically in terms of fuel so you mentioned astrocytes. I want to break it down for people a little bit, the different glial cells in mm. the brain. So in the brain, there are neurons, which people are probably familiar with, but a lot of the brain is also made up of non-neuronal tissue, right? Yeah. Sort of so, supporting tissue. Yeah, and this, this it, it's really interesting because we're, we're basically just exiting this period of, of like the neuronal dominance of... Like so, everything to do with the brain is neur is like it, it, the 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 base of the word is neuron or neural, right? So, a neurologist, neur- neurodegenerative, but actually, the majority of the brain is taken up by cells that are not neurons. Um, and this like actually goes back to like some arguments about physiologists back when these when the brain was first like the cells were first being discovered. So it's just kind of like interesting historically, but. So there are three other main, so there are four main cell types in the brain. Um, actually, if you look at all the different cell types in terms of the genes they're turning on and the proteins they're making and all that kind of stuff, there's probably like several hundred, if not several thousand different like transcriptionally distinct types of cells. But the main cells that we talk about are neurons, obviously, and then the glia, um, um, astroglia or astrocytes, microglia, um, and oligodendroglia or oligodendrocytes. So those are the, the four main ones. And uh, so astrocytes, they're, they're basically like the metabolic regulators of the brain. Probably they do most of the, the, um, the uh, production and turnover of metabolic fuels that say the neurons then depend on. But they also help regulate the blood-brain barrier. So they're intimately connected with 
with um with the they have sort of podocytes which which uh wrap the capillaries in the brain and sort of help regulate the things that get into and out of the brain um like both water and you know metabolites and then microglia they're basically your resident um immune cells in the brain so um they come from the same lineage as macrophages, which some people may have heard of, and they're very they're very similar. Um, when you get a brain injury, you may like uh, macrophages may also come to the brain, or you have the microglia in the brain that do most of the job. Um, and then uh, oligodendrocytes, they basically form your white matter. So those parts um, of the brain underneath, like the wrinkly bit of the cortex, uh, the white matter is where most of the like the broadband high speed transmission happens. Like that's that's why that's what white matter is is essentially there for. So. Um, those are those are the four main cells, and so uh, ApoE4 tends to be made in astrocytes and taken up in neurons. But I think there's some evidence that microglia can make ApoE4 too. And again, that probably just points to the fact that it has an important immune role. The oligodendrocytes are involved in the formation of myelin, right? They yeah. make the myelin sheaths. Yeah. So people who are familiar with multiple sclerosis, uh, the JC virus causes progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. These demyelinating processes affect the oligodendrocytes, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the neurons, the axonal sheath of the neurons get wrapped in the myelin, yeah. um, kind of like a, a hot dog in a bun type of thing. And, you know, the oligodendrocytes are making that myelin. Yeah. And then, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about APOE in the setting of cholesterol and why people get concerned about it you know what do you think is going on or maybe we should talk about how the apoe4 isomer isoforms are felt to be different how is two different than three different than four so people can understand this mechanism a little bit yes so i think so what happens with e4 is it causes a conformational change in the protein um and it basically has this like you can see these x-ray crystallography pictures of it. it's basically like there's this arm that kind of like flips out and it kind of it kind of just alters the way um, it interacts with the receptors and the way things are bound. So then it alters the way that uh, cholesterol is taken up. And, you know, in the setting of any kind of um, injurious or inflammatory process, you know, because it's obviously part of that system, it seems to sort of amplify that. Um, when you look at the ApoE2, um, so ApoE2 homozygotes are actually m more uncommon or less common than the ApoE4 homozygotes. So you have two ApoE2 um copies and they also seem to be associated that also seems to be associated with a slightly increased risk not of um alzheimer's disease but of you know elevated cholesterol and and, car and uh, cardiovascular disease of course again in that same setting that we were talking about earlier so they 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 directly change the way that you know cholesterol is moved and then interact interacts with the cells and that's you know when we when we're thinking purely from an an ldl perspective then we're worried about that because you you might be an increasing the levels of those that you're sort of measuring in the blood um but obviously you know that's like a hugely oversimplified view but that's what that, that that's how people look at it so when when you have we talked about the how apoe4 might increase the risk of alzheimer's disease and that certainly uh, seems to be the case and i think that's what most people are worried about um and it does you know it may increase the risk um or you know may increase the the increase in cholesterol that we see in people who eat particularly saturated fat so people who are, who have apoe4 are told that they should eat less saturated fat you know and maybe like refined source of saturated fat so you're not going to so like bulletproof coffee out the window but we've already talked about that so you, so if you're listening to this podcast you know I'm sure you're not doing that anymore um and you know beyond that I don't think it's necessarily going to be something that that's really worth worrying about because um of all the other things that that we're probably going to talk about and that's that there are a number of things that we know are associated with alzheimer's disease and dementia and they are you know we talk about uh, sleep quality uh, nutrient quality um uh, omega-3 fatty acids um you know, hyperglycemia or swings in blood sugar you know all of these things are associated with an increased risk of alzheimer's disease and and they do seem to interact with apoe4 and in like just incrementally increase that risk but i think um, it's just because you're amplifying the response to neuronal injury. So when, when you're looking at the, the, the markers of the main marker of Alzheimer's disease that we've kind of focused on is, is um, amyloid beta, right? So it, you, can, you can look at it on scans in the brain. You can look at it in mice. You can look at it in, um, uh, in like post-mortem samples of, of, of people who've had various uh, neurocognitive problems or diseases. And, and amyloid beta definitely shows up, right? But it's 
you, if you have more amyloid beta that, that doesn't necessarily correlate with uh, better cognition if you get rid of the amyloid beta with a drug that doesn't improve cognition um and it's because amyloid beta is it's basically just a response to neuronal stress and all the things that i mentioned just then in terms of like hypoglycemia poor sleep um certain infections heavy metals they just cause neuronal stress and they and amyloid beta has an anti-inflammatory antioxidant antimicrobial effect so when the brain becomes stressed it produces this protein it's protecting itself from it and yes, so you can get to a point where too much amyloid beta just accumulates and it becomes problematic, but that's much further down the line. However, if you have these things that are causing this neuronal stress, that's potentially going to be amplified by the presence of ApoE4. So you may then get Alzheimer's disease earlier um, or more severely. But again, it all starts with those factors causing neuronal stress and ApoE4 itself isn't, isn't, isn't causing neuronal damage. Yeah, yeah, lots of stuff to unpack in that statement. Sorry, so, I, I probably just talked without breathing for about five minutes. <laughs> That's good. It's it's just like rainbows <laughs> coming out of your mouth. I'm just like, whoa, this guy. So let's just back up a second and talk about why are people told not to eat high fat or to avoid saturated fat when they have ApoE4? Like, what is going on there? Because Here's what I found. In my research, I found a 2002 epidemiology study showing that people who had higher cholesterol levels had a higher incidence of Alzheimer's, something like that. Yeah. And I feel like this is why people are being told not to avoid, uh, to avoid saturated fat and to avoid fat, especially when they have ApoE4. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of intellectual jumping here, right? Yeah. There's and a, it's lo a, lot of sort of, uh, a lot of leaps, intellectual leaps that are not necessarily clear. Yeah, and th th that's exactly what it is. And it's <clears throat> when, you, when you see those associations, so people with elevated um, total cholesterol, or LDL cholesterol, uh, particularly, particularly in midlife, it seems to be more. In later life, the, the associations don't hold up nearly as much. And that's probably because, like we talked about, cholesterol certainly seems to be protective, especially as we get older. But in midlife, there seems to be an association. But you also have to remember, like you go back to the fact that insulin sensitivity um, is a direct modulator of, of circulating cholesterol levels in people who are eating a mixed diet. So um, your PCSK9 levels, which modulate your LDL receptor, LDL receptor function and number, all of that is directly tied to, tied to insulin sensitivity. So if you're insulin resistant, again, you might see elevated cholesterol levels, but that doesn't mean it's the cholesterol that's, direct, that's directly damaging. Um, and so if you are ApoE4, and you eat more saturated fat, it does seem that you might get an increase in, in cholesterol levels. And so immediately, like, we want to shut that down because of all those, other, all those other associations. So that's, I think that's where most of it's coming from. There are some, and again, this is kind of the nuance of, of uh, manipulating the lipid system with statins, but there are some studies that suggest that, like, on a really large scale, you know, maybe statins slightly reduce dementia risk, but there's just so much nuance in there in terms of the type of statin, the type of person, you know, whether you're completely suppressing their cholesterol production in their brain and if you're doing that you're definitely going to increase your their risk of dementia so so all of that kind of ties into people saying oh you have Ap apoe4 that's going to increase your cholesterol level therefore you know don't eat saturated fat because that's just going to make it worse which you know a lot of jumps like you said so many intellectual leaps here and yet it is it is talked about as if it were canon and yeah that is what frustrates me people say oh duh if you have apoe4 you should not eat saturated fat you should not eat a high fat diet you should not eat keto you should not do carnivore should not have a high LDL. And I love what you said there, that insulin resistance itself can affect LDL to metabolism yeah. and can affect, can affect LDL to the point that it raises LDL or total cholesterol. Yeah. And I think that the main confusion with ketogenic and carnivore diets arises because you can also raise total cholesterol with diet. Yeah. And that is probably not the same. Like the mechanism of what caused it is probably the un is probably the difference rather than the actual end result is exactly. much more important. Yeah. And that's something I've talked about with Dave Feldman and Siobhan on previous podcasts and I'll emphasize again here. This I think is the epitome of the confusion in Western medicine. That we are hyper focused on LDL because we are myopic. And maybe not you and I, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I I'm just grouping us all together. And when we are hypofocused on LDL, we miss the forest for the trees, and we miss the fact that it is probably the mechanism by which you are achieving the elevated LDL rather than the elevated LDL that is most predictive of your future cardiovascular overall yeah. health, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that you can achieve a high LDL with insulin resistance through affecting LDL receptor metabolism yeah. or through a ketogenic or carnivore diet through different pathways having to do with increased 
cholesterol synthesis. Or prolonged fasting, and a lot of people exactly. will, will, will like really LDL. ramp up your LDL. Exactly. Yeah. Fasting will increase your LDL, all of these things. And so yeah. that is a very important thing to emphasize, that therein lies the rub. Yeah. Th therein lies the main thing that we are hoping to delineate here. And so, yes, this is my impression, is that people are just so scared of ApoE4 because the uh, odds ratio, as you discussed in the beginning, is quite high. Yeah. It's 13.4, I think I looked up, if you're homozygous for ApoE4. For yeah. It. And again, I want to emphasize, this is water. It all has to do with the milieu in which we're swimming. And I wish it would be studied in a population that did not have those same risk factors or in which 82.4% were not insulin. And it has. And we can talk about that study right now. So remember, yeah. We, yeah, so there's, they looked at um, ApoE4 and cognition in the Bolivian semen, who are a hunter-gatherer population. And in that population, and they have, a, it's, like, like I mentioned, the immune effects, they have a high parasite burden. So like for them, ApoE4 is probably going to be beneficial because they're going to be better off at f fighting off those parasites. But in them, uh, having ApoE4 was protective of cognition in the elderly. And just like all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God, what on earth is going on here? And at the same time, they've done a number of studies recently. They've taken the semen, they've done like coronary calcium scores and like none of them have any coronary calcium. Interestingly, they did build... Um, in the paper, they they had they said that elevated LDL in these guys was associated was a risk factor for elevated coronary artery calcium. But then when they built a statistical model to predict coronary artery calcium, oh hang on a second, LDL drops out and it's no longer no longer important. What a surprise! That was swept under the rug. Um, but you'll you'll see it if you read the paper. But importantly, if you look at these, so they looked at like seven hundred of these um, uh, of this population across like a whole a whole range of ages their overall type 2 diabetes rate was 0%, right? So when you're then thinking about ApoE4 in that population, if insulin resistance is the major risk factor for, um, for some of the negative effects of ApoE4 on cognition, so hyperglycemia and you know, problems with insulin signaling, because insulin is a growth factor, you know, is, is it potentially important to like, keep, your, keep your cells happy to, to, to an extent? Um, you know, if you don't have diabetes and you have ApoE4, it may even be protective, at least in this, you know, if you sort of like go back to something that's closer to our, you know, more recent origins. But diabetes is contagious. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to avoid diabetes, Tommy. <laughs> oh, wait, <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you're, uh, yeah, so uh, I, think, I think we're now at 20% type 2 diabetes and over 65s in the US. You know, we're working really hard to, uh, to, to, to spread it as much as we can. It certainly seems like it's contagious. Yeah. But you and I are not susceptible. I don't think so. Well, we're, sus we're, we're susceptible because the environment we live in, but we'll work hard to, to, to minimize it. Exactly. Obviously, I'm, I'm being tongue-in-cheek here, guys. Diabetes is not contagious <laughs> and it's highly modifiable with diet. So this is the Bolivian semen. Do you know how to spell that? I can link yeah. to it in the show notes, but a lot of people don't look at the show notes. T S I M A N E is so semen A Bolivian yeah. semen A. I have n I have literally zero clue whether I'm pronouncing it correctly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you've sent me the reference in the past. I'll try to link to it in the show notes. Yeah. And I will probably do a post about it on my Instagram and stuff. But if people Google like Bolivian semen A, yeah. So there's a lot. Th there's a big yeah, it. and there's a big uh, there's a big effort to really study these guys and you know their disease risk and also um that you know a lot looking at their um child development practices and breastfeeding and nutrition and all that kind of stuff so so there's a big effort at the moment to and you know i kind of i wonder a bit about heisenberg's uncertainty principle like all the all the white white scientists descend into bolivia to try and like study these people and of course you're then you're going to you're going to change the thing that you're studying but i think at least for the moment we can kind of trust some of the they're going to leave bagels around <laughs> it's going to blow <laughs> it's going to compound the whole damn system yeah so let i I want to echo something that we said earlier and re-emphasize it. And then I want to talk about a few things, including statins and dementia, which is quite interesting, and the amyloid hypothesis, which you mentioned, and then probably brain insulin resistance in Alzheimer's. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier a point that I wanted to cite during this podcast, which is that the ApoE4 allele is the most primordial allele of ApoE. And it's the most recent. It's the, well, the ApoE4. Yeah, it's the most recent. Well, it's, that one's been around for 8 million years. And then ApoE3 happened 220,000 years ago. Yeah. So like you're saying, I guess what I'm saying here is ApoE4 arose 8 million years ago from what I learned. Uh -huh. And that was what we had through the majority of our evolution as humans. Yeah. So for the majority of our time as humans, which I would argue was mostly carnivorous based upon stable nitrogen isotope studies and whatever, we had ApoE4. 
And ApoE3 only showed up 220,000 years ago. ApoE2 only showed up 80,000 years ago. So I wanted to emphasize that point because of personal. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I meant, yeah, so we, we got that first as we came down from primates and then the other ones. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the majority of our human evolution, which I would suggest was hypercarnivore, we were eating mostly animals, it was ApoE4 that we had. So again, there's an evolutionary mismatch if we believe that eating animals is going to make us weaker in the setting of ApoE4. And for all the people who are wondering, can I do a ketogenic or carnivore diet with ApoE4, whether you're heterozygous or homozygous for that allele, your ancestors did it for the majority of human evolution. And I think this, this does bring up interesting thoughts about um, evolutionary pressure and longevity, right? Because, you know, we, we're traditionally taught that and I don't necessarily have the right answer have the right answer here but we're traditionally taught that your genes only care about getting to the point where you can reproduce and then after that there's no there's no selection pressure and I'm not sure that's entirely true because there's something called the like the grandmother hypothesis or something like that which is that if you can stay alive after your kids and their kids are born and you can help look after them then your that line your genealogical line is more likely to survive Right. So 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 there may be some. So if you had some gene that causes you to suddenly die after you reproduce, right, that would be the most extreme version right? you reproduce and then you immediately drop like a salmon. Yeah. Then you're not you're not around to help your family grow and survive. And so they're more likely to die themselves so that those genes are more likely to die out. So I think there is some evolutionary pressure over long time scales for people who can survive and be functional and help their own genes survive forward so so i think there's there's definitely something there's something you know you have to think about the bigger picture when you're thinking about you know so if some people so I'm, I'm thinking about people who might argue against your comment about well most of our lives we had a apoe4 and they might say well yeah but then you dropped dead at 40 so it doesn't matter um, and so i think there is some i think there's there's something to the thought of the of the fact that um, your genes still become important if you're able to then keep your progeny alive. I love that. Thank you for adding that because that is one of the common things people will say is your ancestors didn't live that long. And, yeah. and I was reading a paper by Miki Bendor for uh, my talk, which I gave yesterday at AHS, which was about fat and the unique nutritional quality of fat. And people can see that online. I will repost that. It'll be reposted at Ancestral Health. But in that paper there was some ethnographic evidence, which I'm sure you're aware of, but I want to relate to the listeners, that in indigenous populations, mortality from zero to 10 years old is 150 times higher yeah. than it is in westernized developed populations. And so that is certainly a confounder for oh, yeah. life expectancy and all these things. And so yeah. anyone that says, oh, your ancestors only lived to be 40, it's like, yeah, as an average, they had a lower life expectancy. And that is probably because of sanitation and other things. Which or saber tooth tigers and woolly mammoths and, and getting trampled. Now we get to take advantage of the, of the things that keep us alive as kids, particularly right. This like dramatically reduced childhood mortality, but then we also get to take advantage of the things that probably you know keep us alive even longer once we get through that period of risk. Like we can we can have our cake and eat it by benefiting from the the better bits of modern medicine and then applying some ancestral health principles to keep us alive as long as possible. Or just you know clean water. <laughs> And, well, that too. and toilets are probably yeah. the biggest thing. So, that, so that, that's. I mean, I've, I well, mean, you see, you know, I I do research in the in the so like the neonatal field, and like neonatologists definitely keep babies alive and keep like pediatricians work hard to keep kids alive who would otherwise die in right. hunting other populations. So there is some benefit. Like we're not all right. entirely useless in a small in a small in a small population of very sick kids. <laughs> I'm just thinking for like the majority of people, the biggest improvements are probably just clean running water. Oh yeah, yeah toilets yeah, and sanitation. Yeah. yeah, where you poop. All right, so. Let's finish this discussion and then move on to statins and some of the other topics. But do you understand why ApoE4 is beneficial from that infectious standpoint? It's because of the LDL thing and the fact that it, there's something about the ApoE4 molecule on the, on the apolipoproteins or on the lipoprotein molecules that allows it to have a different immune function. Yeah, it's a, I, like the exact mechanistic um, effect. No, no, I don't know. But I, it's the... It seems to cause a more targeted and greater immune response to whatever insult, be that in the brain or peripherally. So you're better off at fighting, fighting off whatever infection it is or whatever insult it is that you're, that you're exposed to. So just to sort of re-emphasize this, so theoretically, if we can avoid this catching, this, this contagious insulin resistance by our best efforts of living a good lifestyle – 
it could even be protective to have an ApoE4 allele. Yeah, possibly. If you were yeah. doing radical things like wrangling sharks or <laughs> <laughs> so there are so there's, there's still so I think um, you you'll still need like making sure that you've ticked all those boxes is probably more important than ApoE4s than everybody else, right? I, I think there's definitely enough evidence to suggest that. So all these lifestyle things in terms of uh, nutrient quality and circadian rhythms and sleep and um, that I think that's going to be m probably more important than ApoE4s just because you're more sensitive to a uh, to a neurological insult. Similarly, ApoE4s seem to be seem to get a worse outcome after head injury. So if you're right. an ApoE4, stop boxing right now. Like just don't make a living out and get punched in the head. Like that's going to be even worse if you're an ApoE4. So so like that stuff, I think you know you do need to to, to be aware of and 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 so like dale bredesen who's probably one of the more interesting alzheimer's guys definitely thinking very deeply about like uh alzheimer's as a system he's not a big fan of large amounts of refined saturated fats in apoe 4s and, and i think there's there's potentially something there uh but again i'm not a big fan of refined any kind of fat anyway so i i don't think that changes for apoe 4s but that is you know, it's kind of a, that would be a, a low risk, high potential benefit to just like not slug back huge amounts of butter and MCT oil and stuff like that. If you're going to go into ketosis, do it through fasting or by, you know, making sure you're you know, reducing carbohydrate and adequate protein and all that kind of stuff. Let's highlight the difference between refined and unrefined saturated fat, because I think people will hear those recommendations and think that he's talking about all saturated fat, or at least we mm -hmm. can't speak for Dale Bredesen, but what are your sense of like, the consumption of unrefined saturated fat for someone with an ApoE4. Yeah, so I, I don't think that's going to be problematic, and mainly because unrefined saturated fat comes in less than a one-to-one -one ratio with other fats, right? So if we're thinking about, so I, so I know tallow is a big part of your fat intake, and tallow is more than 50% monounsaturated with a bit of polyunsaturated fat. So yes, there's some saturated fat in there. It's within all the structures. It's not going to, you know, shouldn't cause the same sort of dramatic shifts in endotoxin if that's something that's that's that's, uh, that's an issue for you and it's a, it's in a much more um i mean it's like natural and quite like that that's how we would normally have received fat um so so i think it, it's not about avoiding fat um you if you compare that to say butter which you put in your bulletproof coffee which is the not vast me. majority, not, yeah, not you. The vast majority is refined, saturated fat that has been taken out of um, the the li sort of the li the lipoprotein structures which you would have in milk, which which are the, the kind of the natural state for that saturated fat. In, in butter, those have essentially been removed, and it's just you know as soon as it go, even if you have solid butter, it's basically just a liquid fat delivery system once it hits your gut. So. So, yeah, it's not that saturated fat in itself is bad, but large influxes of these refined saturated fats. And I think MCT oil potentially goes in there too, partic uh, particularly if it's got a lot of, um, a lot of C10 um, and, and, C and particularly C12. Um, so, so, yeah, that, the, 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 there's a big, um, yeah, that's a big important difference. So there's a difference between refined saturated fat, which would, we would characterize as liquid fat, and unrefined saturated fat, which would be although something. refined saturated fat at room temperature is not liquid, so right, 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 but right. it's liquid once it goes in the body usually. Yeah. yeah, it's liquid once it gets above seventy-seven or seventy-eight degrees, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 it doesn't look like liquid, but it's essentially liquid fat. Yeah. And what I'm eating mostly now is grass-fed trimmings and suet, which is kidney fat, and I'm really exploring. And that was what my whole talk at AHS was about this year: is the concept of the fat is an organ. Yeah. And I'm advocating for eating organ meats and unrefined fat in the form of trimmings, in the form of suet, in the form of uh, unrefined fat. That is non-heated, non-rendered fat is probably a very beneficial thing for humans. And when we're looking at liquid fat, it's changing the equation somewhat. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that's the structure that it comes in and the 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 amounts that it comes in. Well, I think there's probably a combination or com and and what it's what it's coming with. I think all of that plays an important part. And as we talked about in the first podcast, there is a hypothesis that perhaps the liquid fat would affect your gut differently, could potentiate more translocation of endotoxin across the gut lining, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the statins. I just want to mention you mentioned it earlier. I found a study this morning that was pretty clear that fungal derived statins People are going, what? Fungus? Statin? Yes, many statins are from fungi, fungi, 
and lipophilic statins, that is statins that are soluble in, li- in lipids, yeah. are associated with a higher incidence of cognitive decline and dementia. Yeah. Have you seen those studies as well? Yeah, and so that's uh, yeah. Red rice yeast extract is sometimes sold in health food stores to reduce cholesterol, and that's actually probably the first time we discovered a statin type molecule, and that's where a lot of the statins came from. Um, but yeah, that's that's the effect. So they're they're basically mitochondrial poisons, which reduce your which reduce your cholesterol. Um, and it's actually really interesting if if you do a lot of organic acids tests, you can see some people who have. Um, a fungal overgrowth. You can see what looks exactly like um, inhibition of the mevalonate pathway, like you'd get with a statin, but it's because of the yeast rather than because of rather than because of the statin or because of a statin. What does it look like on a note? Um, so it's. I'm trying to remember. I mean, I'm that's not going to measure. Having, it's not going to measure coins no, and no, directly. Having, no, I'm having a. I'm having a. Because when you say they're mitochondrial poisons, I'm thinking that's because the mevalonic pathway is also making coins. I'm Q10. Yeah. And that is going to affect. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the it's the it's the um it's upstream. So when you have accumulation of the factors that require Q10 for for metabolism. Right. You can see it on the oat. Yeah, you can see it on the. Yeah, oat. yeah. So one of the things that I talked about in my talk yesterday here was that in carnivores, the coenzyme Q10 levels are off the charts. Yeah. It's fascinating. And when I see someone with a low coenzyme Q10, I get worried. And that's what Tommy's talking about when he's saying statins are mitochondrial poisons. I believe that the mechanism that is accepted for that, and that is not necessarily a radical concept nor a controversial notion to say that statins are mitochondrial poisons. No. That's fairly well yeah, documented that, in the literature. Yeah. That that occurs because the mevalonate pathway, which is what is inhibited by statins when they're inhibiting HMG-CoA reductase, which is one of the enzymes high up in the mevalonate pathway, will affect the production of coenzyme Q10. Yeah, yeah. And exactly. you won't get it. Yeah. yeah. Big uh, so, problems. Yeah, so, so then if, if we're thinking about the fact that cholesterol is essential for uh, membrane and cellular production and health within the brain, and uh, the, the brain makes its own cholesterol, and that in order, you're much more likely to get a drug into the brain if it's lipophilic, if it can cross a cell membrane. So then the lipophilic statins... Uh, do seem, you know, particularly in high doses, are going to be much more likely to cross into the brain and then suppress cholesterol production. And that, you know, and you're going to need that cholesterol for proper cell health in your brain. If you don't have it, then you have an increased risk of dementia. So, those, you know, if, if people are uh, taking statins, they're worried about their risk of dementia. Of, you know, it, in conjunction with your doctor, talk about potentially switching to non lipophilic statins. And most of the more recent statins are hydrophilic not lipophilic so that's going to be potentially you know slightly safer from that regard but you can also do more advanced um lipid testing uh so i know you've done the true health diagnostics a few times if you have low desmosterol which is a marker it's, it's, it's within the cholesterol synthesis pathway if you're low desmosterol and you're taking a lipophilic statin that's gonna g- make it likely that you're suppressing cholesterol production in your brain beyond what you would want so so like there's there's some detective work you can do based on what what you're taking what you're doing um that can sort of like help you figure out whether what you're what you're doing or what you're taking is going to be affecting your 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 uh, dementia risk i believe the lipophilic statins are atorvastatin simvastatin and lovastatin yeah uh, i guess lovastatin is a fungal derived statin but atorvastatin which is lipitor simvastatin which is What's the trade name for Simvastatin? Why can't I remember that? In the UK, we just call them their actual names. We don't Simba. do this ridiculous marketing stuff. I don't remember drugs. that. I, it's been too long since I was a PA in cardiology. Anyway, it's Lipitor and Simvastatin. Simvastatin is probably so generic. Crestor. No, is Crestor. Crestor, well, Crestor or Resuvastatin? Crestor is Resuvastatin. Yeah, 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 yeah. is Lipitor. I'll think of Simvastatin. Anyway, yeah. Simvastatin, Lovastatin, Atorvastatin, which is Lipitor, are the lipid-soluble statins. But again, as, and also, as Tommy says, what I'll add to that is well, I don't want to be contrarian or undermine people with their physicians, but this whole conversation is sort of couched in the notion that perhaps you don't need a statin if you're not insulin resistant, but <laughs> we'll leave that for future discussions. And, 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 and again, I, I, you can back that up with more, more evidence. So things like um, if, you, if you look at the 4S trial, one of the original big statin trials, those who had a low triglyceride to HDL ratio did not get a benefit from taking a statin. Um, if you have a coronary artery calcium score and you don't have any coronary artery calcium, they've also looked at uh, studies where if you have a coronary artery calcium score of zero or less than 100, then you don't get, don't get an overall statistical benefit from a statin. So there's multiple ways to look at your health and that suggests that if you are in good metabolic health and you're not insulin resistant, then a statin doesn't seem to benefit. 
I love it because I think a lot of people ask about that and they're curious. But I just want to emphasize for people, and it deserves a whole podcast, that there is some evidence that um, statins could contribute to dementia, especially the lipophilic statins, by affecting the way that cholesterol is moving in the brain. And I will highlight what Tommy said earlier, that the brain has its own supply of cholesterol. It cannot support transport cholesterol across the blood-brain barrier. So if you have a lipophilic statin which crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets into the brain, you can affect the way that cholesterol is made in the brain and the brain cannot pull cholesterol from the periphery uh, and you could create a cholesterol deficiency in the brain. Cholesterol is a nutrient that your neurons need for memory and learning and all these things. Yeah. We've already talked about so much cool stuff. Let's talk a little bit more about this amyloid hypothesis of Alzheimer's because uh-huh. I want to, we talked, you talked about it a little bit earlier. I think that in the mainstream media, most people just think, oh, it's amyloid beta. You know, it's a, it's a tauopathy. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit because you, you sort of touched on it. Let's just say it one more time that uh, I guess I'll, I'll give you the, the softball pitch with what I've heard, though I haven't seen the actual studies, that when we've actually done, I don't know whether it's any sense RNA studies with uh, amyloid or when we've completely knocked out amyloid, it does, it's not protective in animal models. Yeah. And so, well, so that, that's kind of true and kind of not true. So, so in animal models, if you, if you create, so what, so what they'll do is they'll create like a, a triple genetic model in a mouse that will dramatically increase its production of amyloid. And those uh, mice do get like mouse Alzheimer's. And then if you give those guys, say, like, a, a, an, anti- like an antibody therapy, a, a monoclonal antibody that tries to clear amyloid, they do see some benefit. And that kind of, it goes down, to, you know, when you're looking end of pipe, some of this stuff has the, you know, again, it looks like it, looks like it might be beneficial. But then they've tried, the, several um, pharmaceutical companies have spent probably dozens of billions of dollars now testing these therapies and trials and no therapy aimed to reduce amyloid beta has been shown to be has been shown to be neuroprotective and in fact you know there's a new seems to be a new one every year and and and, and a lot of people are now giving up on that as as a process but when you sort of really dig down into the data you'll see things so in both animals and humans amyloid beta burden doesn't correlate with symptom burden Right, and then if you then if you remove amyloid from the brain in humans, you don't get this dramatic improvement. And of course, you may have caused injury that you can't completely repair, but you don't get this dramatic improvement. You may you may slightly slow the decline, but you certainly don't get reversal. And I think the, the and then so now that the amyloid uh, beta has been is being kind of like thrown under the bus. Now we're on tau. And so tau is like, is another protein that's associated with this. Amyloid beta accumulation seems to trigger the production of tau, which causes these neurofibrillary tangles, which can actually like physically restrict neurons and neuronal function. Like they can be physically damaging. But again, like you're, you're just looking down at the next step of the problem rather than looking upstream, you're looking further downstream. And so when again if you sort of look at the the broad spectrum of things associated with alzheimer's disease and the accumulation of amyloid beta it's those things that we talked about earlier so chronic stress including sleep deprivation um you know, nutrient insufficiency hyperglycemia or swings in in um uh, glucose uh, toxic metal exposure um infection so there's a number of studies showing actually like uh, viral particles associated with amyloid beta uh, plaques in the brain of people with alzheimer's disease and so like individually everybody's like so one person's like oh it's all infections and one person's like oh it's all diabetes it's type you know type 2 diabetes insulin resistance in the brain somebody else is like oh it's all bma bmaa which is a an algal um, an algal toxin which which causes amyloid accumulation in like this again this hunter gatherer population who they eat these fruit bats who eat this fruit that has a lot of BMAA in it and then these guys get Alzheimer's disease so there's one person who's like oh yeah it's all BMAA it's all from like algal blooms and algal toxins and like so everybody again like takes this reductionist approach but if you take a big picture approach all of these things cause neuronal stress they cause neuronal damage and then what does this what do the neurons do in response they produce amyloid beta and that's because it's protective it has anti-inflammatory antioxidant some antimicrobial effects so all of so that would cover all those things we just talked about and yes if you never clear that because you don't ever remove the the stressor or the injurious factor or because you're not sleeping properly. That's another way that we sort of recycle and clear amyloid beta. 
then this stuff will accumulate and eventually there'll be so much of it that it's problematic. And then that's where we're focusing all of our efforts is that point, rather than looking all the way upstream and saying, okay, what are all the things that cause neuronal stress? How do I re like remove, reduce and, and mitigate those instead? Can't make a drug for that, Tommy. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> There's no money in it. But look, instead you could be barefoot outside in the sunshine. That's what I'm talking doing, about. Doing but squats. That's, that's my sort of conspiratorial interjection there, that the reason, that perhaps the reason those sorts of things are never focused on is because you can't make a drug for good quality sleep. You can't make a drug for a good diet. You can't make a drug for any of those things, right? It's lifestyle, which you can't make a drug for. Yeah. And so this is the problem, and I think this is hopefully what podcasts like this and others help people to be aware of, that the... And, hopefully the way in which we can change medical education in the future that Ken Berry said it so well, Western medical education is about teaching physicians what drug to give. Yeah. It's not about teaching physicians what the root cause of the problem is. And I think, and part, I, mean, I always like, it's okay coming from you because you're also a doctor, but like sometimes I feel like a bit, like doctors get attacked by this stuff, but it's really is, well, there's outside interest and stuff, but it's also like a, a time pressure and total pressure on the system problem. Like what's, what's faster spending an hour with somebody to figure out their diet and lifestyle and actually creating the commitment and the habits required for behavioral change so that they, you know, overall improve their disease risk or or like getting out the prescription pad and just because of the total stress on the system it almost becomes a necessity because we just don't have time within the current structure of the system to um, address these things in a, in, in a bigger scale and i think that that harkens back to a conversation i had with ken barry recently that how is the system broken i mean i think the system is kind of broken and the fact that it won't reimburse physicians to spend time with people talking about that yeah. and then for listeners who are not physicians I think this is the this is the suggestion to value your health and to realize that a mainstream physician who is bound by insurance time constraints may not be able to do this type of medicine with you. Yeah. And that's hard because functional medicine takes more time and as I do in my practice, as many physicians do in their practices, the insurance model doesn't support what we do. Yeah. Unfortunately, and I think that that's I see it as a good thing in my practice. I think it's the beginning of a change in healthcare for people. But like you're saying, time pressure within insurance-based models of care does not allow for this type of medicine. Yeah. And physicians want to help people. They're intelligent and well-intentioned. And the only thing that they can do in 15 minutes is think about a drug. Yeah. And that's not how people get well. And that's not how we change the system. Yeah, so that's a tricky thing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about insulin resistance because I want to wrap up with this. The idea here is... Alzheimer's has been called type 3 diabetes, whatever, yeah. right? It's been said, and there's plenty of literature about brain insulin resistance in yeah. Alzheimer's. And I think yeah. this kind of ties it all together. Let's just start with a, a basic discussion of what insulin resistance is in the body, and then yeah. we'll talk about it in the brain. Yeah, so insulin resistance is essentially the, um, the outcome of cells saying that they don't want any more energy. That's, that's, that's essentially what it is. It's like the cell is saying... I'm I'm fine, thanks. No more, no more glucose. No more, no more energy. I just can't tolerate it, and that that comes from a number of different like areas. So it could be that you've had so much so much energy stuffed into it that you that the cell doesn't want any more. It could be that the mitochondria are damaged, oxidative stress, inflammation, all of these things, because inflammation wants you to shift your resources elsewhere because it's assuming that there's some kind of infection. You want to shift resources to the to the immune system because that's that's going to be needed to, to to fight the infection. That's where the inflammation is assumed to be coming from. Um, and when when you're looking at sort of the stages of insulin resistance, in most people it seems to start in the fat. So having nice insulin sensitive fat is like your buffer for metabolic disease. So I, everybody's like really against fat. You know, like they're trying to maybe they get liposuction or they try and go for like fat cell apoptosis and all this kind of stuff. Don't do that because you, it's going to increase your risk of diabetes in 20 years time because that having having that fat is protective. Like fat is an organ. Fat is an organ. It's super important. So so yeah. So so it seems to start in the fat. And then it, it kind of de it depends on, uh, I think, the person. But like some people will argue that it starts in the muscle. And if you're super sedentary, yeah, that might be the case. Um, but what it's essentially the cell saying, I do not have uh, the ability uh, or the desire to process the nutrients that you're sending me. That's what insulin resistance is. It's like a suitcase that's full. Yeah. You can't pack any more T-shirts in there. Yeah, and that's either because the capacity is decreased 
right? Because they, um, um, because there's injury to your mitochondria, or and you know that directly feeds back to the insulin um, receptor, or you're a fat cell and you're just like stuffed full of fat and you just can't take any more, and then you start saying, oh, no, no, no mass, no more. So with regard to fat, I want people to understand that fat cells are cells. They have a nucleus, they have mitochondria, they have a big vacuole in which you put fat, yeah. but they have a cell. They have endoplasmic reticulum, they make proteins, they are a living cell. Yeah. It's not just a bag of fat. Right? <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's an organ. Yeah. It's a hormonally active organ. They secrete adipokines and uh, they have unique nutrients. And that's, again, what I talked about with my AHS talk. But like Tommy is saying, perhaps insulin resistance starts in the fat but many cell types, many organs can become insulin resistant, the liver, the muscle, the fat, yeah, yeah. and they sort of refuse the actions of insulin. They say, no, 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 I'm not going to respond to you. Insulin is a peptide hormone that circulates and generally binds to its receptor, which uh, IGF-1 can also bind to, and signals, hey, take up glucose through the GLUT4 transporter. Yeah. And when it's resistant, it's just like an irascible child says, uh -uh, I ain't cleaning my room. I'm not taking that up anymore. And it's a protective effect. Yeah. It's a protective effect because the mitochondria are damaged uh, or that the, there is just overload of cellular energy and all these things. And so I think I need to do a whole podcast on insulin resistance. The mechanisms are fascinating. Yeah. I talked a little bit about it in the recent podcast with Dave and Siobhan. But the way that I think about insulin resistance is a couple of things can cause it. One of them is oxidative stress related to perhaps too much energy and glucose. In the podcast I did with Dom D'Agostino, he talked about glucose metabolism in some people predisposing to higher levels of oxidative stress through yeah. superoxide dismutase in the mitochondrial electron transport chain and higher production of uh, hydrogen peroxide that isn't actually able to be transformed into uh, or uh, higher production of, excuse me, the peroxide radical or the, the hydroxyl radical that can't be transformed into uh, the other intermediates. And so it is also clear that inflammation in the body, whether it's responding to an infection or an oxidative stress, can trigger insulin resistance. And yeah. as I talked about with Dave and Siobhan, that's probably an evolutionary mechanism by which we shunt resources. Yeah. And we trigger the immune system to be more active. And I think it's getting activated in, inappropriately today because we're exposed to more oxidative stress. It's not an inflammatory issue per se in the sense that it's not an, uh, an infectious issue, yeah. but the body has a system in place whereby it responds to infectious issues with inflammation and insulin resistance. Yeah. Okay, that is awesome. I think hope, hopefully that'll be a good discussion. I don't think we can ever talk about insulin resistance too much on this podcast because <laughs> it's so important. So, and, but one thing that, uh, that really bothers me in, in the insulin resistance space um, is that so like uh, uh, Tim Noakes has recently gotten a lot of uh, like good pub publicity because he's been he's been writing blogs for the CrossFit website talking about like why a cardiovascular disease is the insulin resistance and like yes that's true but what is it that causes insulin resistance like you don't just get it's insulin not contagious it's not contagious you don't just get it spontaneously so yes insulin resistance may be the causative or like the the thing that that binds all these problems together. But what is it that causes insulin resistance? And it's the, this evolutionary mismatch, the, the lack of these factors that, you know, in terms of uh, good nutrition, sleep, movement, maybe even social connection, which, act, you know, if you're socially isolated, that inadvertently or inappropriately activates the immune system. You know, so all of this stuff is why you get insulin resistance. So when people talk about, well, I'm insulin resistant, therefore I reduce my carbohydrate intake. Yes, you can do that, but it doesn't really make any sense to me because I haven't fixed what caused the insulin resistance in the first place. It wasn't just eating too many carbohydrates, like because there are plenty of in, there are plenty of um, populations around the world who do all the things that we talk about in terms of important health, also eat a load of carbohydrate and they're not insulin resistant. So you can't just say I'm insulin resistant, no carbs, job done. Like, I think that's an important. oversimplification as well. I would like to get your opinion about something I heard Volek, uh, Jeff Volek say that he feels like. A large proportion of the population, I think he said 70%, are just not going to tolerate that amount of carbohydrates. Is it possible that there are genetic predispositions in terms of how many carbohydrates we can tolerate before we come in, become insulin resistant? Because clearly the Pima Indian population in southwest Arizona are uniquely sensitive to carbohydrates in terms of getting insulin resistant and diabetes. Yeah, so, so I, really don't, I really don't like it when people just like lump it into be like genetic predisposition because I don't think there's enough to support that. One thing that... I, I would accept is that in the modern Western world, we have found ways to create carbohydrate delivery systems in like in volumes that are just unseen elsewhere. So when you when you compare, so when I say there are the populations that eat a lot of carbohydrate, I'm talking about percent of total calories, right? So if they're not 
if they're not shoveling in several hundred or thousand grams of carbohydrates a day. Because Thousands of grams of carbohydrates. Because which, which some people, yeah, yeah. So some, like some athletes will carb load with like one and a half kilos of, of carbohydrate. Um, How do you even do that? Anyway. Yeah, so I mean, so so that so that that's that's the point where I I, th I think it's important is that we have ways to deli we have ways to give you carbohydrates that just do not exist elsewhere. So like as 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 a percentage of the diet, there are some populations that do just fine with large amounts of carbohydrate, but it's a percentage, and it's the some people argue about the type of the type of carbohydrate that may be part of it. I'm less worried about that than just like the total amount that it's physically like. You could eat a lot of carbs when it's fries and pizza, but when it's sweet potatoes, it's really hard. So, like, it's, it's a percentage. It was a, it's a total amount factor rather than, a, like, a percentage of the diet. I do think it's an oversimplification to just say insulin resistance is excess carbohydrates. Yeah. And, and, and one, one thing that I always say with regard to that is that, yes, if you're insulin resistant, you should reduce your carbohydrate intake. But the inverse of the, the, inverse of the, like, the, the, the treatment isn't necessarily the cause, right? So just because you can treat it, improve symptoms with carbohydrate restriction doesn't mean that it was just too many carbohydrates that caused the, the problem in the first place. As a very selfish aside, I'll just add that I wouldn't be surprised if plant toxins could trigger insulin <laughs> as well <laughs> in some populations. More on that to come. So let's talk about what's going on in the brain. What is brain insulin resistance? Because does insulin cross the blood-brain barrier? I've read no. Yeah, It can. It can, actually. That's yeah. what I read, that it can. Yes. So it can, and it's... It, 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 it's, it's that exact thing. So if you have, so say, I misspoke. It does in, in its most simple in its most simple um, form. Like we talked about, the fact that insulin resistance is cells saying I can't take any more energy. And if you're damaged or you have this inflammatory response, like the same thing can happen in the brain. So that's why um, Alzheimer's disease has sometimes been called type three diabetes because it's well, it's, your risk dramatically increases if you have type two diabetes or metabolic syndrome, and there is some brain level insulin resistance. Um, and so that's probably it's a probably a mark like a downstream marker and a cause because right so it, so insulin resistance is a marker of cellular damage so we've talked about why that might be but it's all like insulin and IGF one are also trophic factors and the the loss of trophic factors are a big um, um, a big contributor to Alzheimer's disease so in women you know particularly you know, their their risk dramatically increases when their estradiol when their estradiol drops around menopause um, and so if you're losing, and, and estradiol is also a trophic factor for neurons, just like um, insulin and IGF-1 are. So if you have none of these things, or you reduce that signaling pathway because it becomes resistant, then you start, then, you know, if, if neurons don't have connections to other neurons, if they don't have these incoming survival signals, they'll just start to die. They'll start to kill themselves. It's like how they're programmed. So trophic factors of which insulin can be an important one, are, you know, are required in a, in a small amount with, with healthy signaling to tell neurons to survive but if they then become resistant they start to lose that that signal you mentioned earlier that the amount of amyloid beta in the brain does not correlate with severity of symptoms nor does removal of amyloid beta result in improvement in symptoms but what does correlate with symptom severity is the amount of loss of cholinergic neurons neurons in the basal forebrain of, yeah. of the brain so that does correlate with symptoms and that harkens back to what you're saying now is insulin as a trophic factor yeah insulin is an anabolic hormone and in the brain insulin is serving an anabolic perhaps trophic is the best better word yeah. role just like in the rest of the body the role of insulin in the brain is a little different because what I was reading was that there's actually a GLUT3 transporter in the brain, which is not insulin. Non-insulin dependent. Non-insulin yeah. dependent. In the periphery, it's GLUT4 on the muscles at least, which is insulin dependent for glucose uptake. Well, ideally, it's um, activation dependent. So you activate your GLUT4 by moving rather than with insulin. That's but, the best way to but activate your GLUT4. Yeah, but you, if, you, if you want to not become insulin resistant, activate your GLUT4 with movement rather than with insulin. That's the best way to do it. And interestingly, in the brain, there's a GLUT3. Yeah. And there's other ones too. And there's some GLUT4 in the brain as well. But the GLUT3 transporter doesn't need insulin. So the brain preferentially, at least that's the colloquial uh, narrative, uh, uses glucose for fuel. Yeah, It can also use ketones, and we all know when we've been in ketosis, we feel good because the brain is running on ketones, and that, that feels good. But the glucose uptake for the neurons doesn't need insulin in the brain. Yeah. But insulin is serving, as I understand it, a more of a trophic role. Yeah, exactly. And if the brain becomes insulin resistant, 
the neurons are going to die off because they're not getting those trophic signals. Yeah. So that's where it's much, and that's where it's much more important is telling telling the cells to survive. And if they lose that because of the cross, like because you can still get that same insulin resistance even though it's not because of glucose coming into the cell because of insulin, you'll still get that same feedback, and then you lose that tro those trophic factors. And it makes total sense that. If you have insulin resistance peripherally, you would develop insulin resistance in the brain. Yeah. In the same way. And the I've read that the CSF, so the cerebrospinal fluid to serum concentration of insulin uh, ratio will increase in states of uh, diabetes and insulin resistance, suggesting that similarly to the periphery, when we become insulin resistant, insulin levels rise. Yeah. So I think it would be a fascinating thing to do spinal taps, to do CSF. Uh, examination for insulin levels. I think, you know, there's so many things. You that, go first. I know, right? <laughs> I know mine is good. My my CSF insulin is not going to be high, I don't think. But wouldn't that be a cool predictor of problems, right? Yeah. And uh, honestly, I don't think we need to do that because we can just look at serum levels. Yeah, yeah. I think you probably have a good idea. I mean, ob obviously, um, you can probably look at a lot of people and guess that they're insulin resistant, but it's not always the case because you can have people who are like super skinny, super lean and still insulin resistant, right? Because it's about much more than that. But Visceral adiposity, skinny yeah, fat. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have covered so much. Let's just round it all up, give people a summary of what we've talked about. So kind of like tie a bow on this for me, Tommy. Like, <laughs> what? So, so I think it's um, like the take-home factors are that um, there are certain things that we that do seem associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, and that could be ApoE4, that could be your LDL particle number, you know, your ApoB, but they're all being studied in the setting of a sick population that has met, uh, that has metabolic disease, which is basically the trigger for these things to cause problems, either because your endothelium is already screwed if you're looking at your arteries, or because you've, you're generating this neuronal stress that then is going to amplify with a, with a bigger amyloid beta response or you know a bigger um, like neuronal injury response. So if you aren't one of those people and you create an environment that doesn't you know, trigger this, these problems with metabolic health because of the food you eat or the sun you expose yourself to or the movement that you do or the people that you surround yourself with, then I think most of these things that are associated um, with worse outcome or increased disease risk may even become beneficial. And we talked about that both in terms of LDL cholesterol and in terms of ApoE4, at least in certain populations. So it's all about just not being the population in which these things are studied, right? And if you're not that, then all of a sudden you probably collapse the vast majority of your risk, regardless of your genetics or, or the numbers of particles floating around in your blood. Not swimming in dirty water. Yeah. This is water. Make sure it's clean. Yeah. Make sure it's clean. And the clean water, as we'll, we're talking about, is insulin sensitivity, metabolic dysfunction, and or metabolic health, which yeah. we've, we've talked a lot about how to achieve that, and there's lots out there about that. Yeah. I see this as... ApoE4 is this apolipoprotein that is, exists on our lipoprotein particles that is involved in the transport of a vital nutrient for humans, that being cholesterol. It does it in the periphery. It's involved in immunologic responses. It does it in the brain. It's involved in uh, critical nutrient delivery to the brain. And there are these evolutionarily variable polymorphisms in ApoE4, th two, three, and four, with four being the most ancient that we've had for the majority of our time as humans throughout all of our evolution, except for the last 200,000 years, most of which we were probably eating lots of animals and it was probably not creating any major risk or was not evolutionarily discordant. And it is, and during that time it was beneficial because it may have protected us from infection. ApoE3 showed up about 200,000 years ago. It's now in the, the majority of the population. But for people who have ApoE4, they may have uniquely they may have unique susceptibilities in the setting of dirty water. In the modern environment, yeah. In the modern environment. And so that is more of a testimony to the way that the modern environment is dangerous than a testimony to the fact that they are necessarily going to get Alzheimer's. It's saying, that's a chink in your armor. Don't get hit with that arrow. Yeah. Don't swim in the dirty water. If you have ApoE4, it's even more important. It doesn't mean that you cannot eat ketogenic diet. It doesn't mean you can't eat fat. It doesn't mean you can't eat carnivore. I do not believe, and I would suspect that you would agree with this, I don't think those things are going to increase your risk of those at all. No. We are seeing in the studies a reflection of the dirty water, of the overall bad sort of environment that, we're, that the majority of people are swimming in. The whole study is in dirty water, so that's what it's looking like. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I'd summarize it. Absolutely. Awesome, absolutely. awesome. So 
Man, it's always so good talking to you. Damn, dude. What is the most radical thing that you have done in the last month, my friend? And oh man, that's such a left field question. Most, uh, I should have warned you. You should have warned me. You haven't, been listening, most, to, you haven't uh, been listening to my podcast. I ask it to everyone now. Yeah, well, there's, yeah, I, uh, I took a break from podcast recently just because it was just it was such a like, it, it became a stressor in its own self. Just I'm to joking. like, you know, you know what I mean? The most radical thing. Yeah, so, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. The most radical thing that I've done um, recently is that I've decided that. As I hit 35, I'm going to try and like be like the biggest and strongest I've ever been in my entire life. I'm going to try that once more. So like I've uh, started uh, to eat a lot more food. That's become the big thing that I've done. That's the big, the big, the big focus of my life most recently. There you go. That's, that's super radical. So you want to get really big and strong? Yeah. You want to do strongman again? Because yeah, you're strongman. Tr- and I haven't competed, but I'd like to compete just, just like for funsies. Cool. Now, yeah. what kind of food are you eating more of? Everything. Everything. Yeah. Um, and that's it. so I, yeah, it's just more of everything. I probably don't, I don't eat a, a huge ton of protein, maybe like 200 grams a day, something like that. Um, and then, you know, a good, a good amount of fat, uh, carbohydrates, usually from pretty good sources. But, you know, sometimes I'll have a, like a big fat bowl of granola, your favorite. <laughs> what you gonna you? He's going to edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me, what are your fat sources and what are your carbohydrate sources? Yeah, so my carbohydrate sources tend to come from like uh, sweet potatoes, maybe some fruit. Um, and my fat sources tend to come from like my eggs and meat and maybe some high fat dairy. We need to get you some suet. Yeah, I, I haven't eaten a lot of suet myself, but uh, oh, I have. We, we ate steaks together. I had some suet, but I haven't bought any to have at home yet. And I got some Iberian pork fat from White Oak Pastures recently. Dude, yeah, it's so good. I was gonna bring it to you today, and I was like, ah, I don't have time. And then you ate it. I'm gonna. I did. Eat it. <laughs> I have a bunch in my fridge, but I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have White Oak Pastures send you some Iberian pork fat. That's gonna be my Thanks. gift to I'm you. Thanks. I'm gonna be super happy with after that. this podcast. Yeah. Um, it is so good. But I am digging the suet and the Iberian uh, hog fat from White Oak Pastures. And so, all right. Well, thank you, sir, for being here. I hopefully we laid it down for you guys, and I hope this was helpful. And I will see you guys in the next podcast episode. Stay radical. All right. Are your minds blown? Because mine was. I just have gotten so many questions about ApoE4 and really wanted to do a deep dive into the research myself. And I thought there was no better person to talk to than Tommy Wood. And I really think that we were able to clearly demonstrate that this is water that it is all about the milieu in which we swim. And when all of these factors are studied in a sick population with 82.4% of whom have metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance, everything's going to look different. And that doesn't mean that a high LDL is always a bad thing, especially if you're insulin sensitive. And it doesn't mean that if you have ApoE4, you can't eat a ketogenic diet or you can't eat a carnivore diet as long as you're insulin sensitive. Now, Of course, the whole equation is different when you're insulin resistant. And if that is the case, you want to change that very swiftly. But as I sort of mentioned jokingly in this podcast, diabetes is not contagious and it is not an infectious disease. And you can definitely modify your insulin sensitivity with the big lever of food and the big lever of lifestyle. So I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you found value in it, please leave a review on iTunes and let other people know that this podcast is radical and that they will find value in it as well. Also, you guys may know that I have a new website. It is carnivoremd.com. Check it out. There you can find The Insider, which is my weekly to bi-weekly newsletter where I tell you about all kinds of cool stuff going on with me. And you can sign up for that. I released an issue just a couple days before this podcast came out and talked about the actual article involving the Bolivian semen A that Tommy references in this podcast. So if you are looking for that, um, it will soon be on my website. I will soon make a post on my website with all of the previous episodes of the Fundamental Health Insider, and you can find that one if you're not already subscribed. And if you're not already subscribed, I would say, what are you doing with your life? Go subscribe check out my stuff. I also have been super interested in eating different types of organ meats recently and white oak pastures sent me all kinds of cool stuff. I'm super excited to collaborate with them in the future. Shout out to them. Shout out to my buddy, Brian Sanders, who helps me with the podcast. He has a podcast, which is peak human. 
and he has nosetail.org. This is not a paid advertisement for nosetail.org. I just appreciate him, and I appreciate that he is providing people with organ meats and organ grinds and ways to get organ meats and ways to get grass-fed meat in a well-done way. So check out nosetail.org if you want to access organ meats. You can also check out White Oak Pastures. The other place that I get my organ meats from sometimes is U.S. Wellness. Again, none of those are paid. I just appreciate them and am happy to give shout-outs. So that is that. Check out my new website. Leave me a review. Thank you for your support. I appreciate you guys all so much. And let me know how this podcast was. I think this is going to really blow some people away. And we are going to really deeply uh, change the paradigm regarding APOE4 and ketogenic and carnivore diets. I think what keeps happening is that we realize, hey, we have been eating this way for our entire evolution as humans. And there is really not a reason not to do this. There are perhaps occasional people, very, very rare people on the planet who have polymorphisms in fatty acid metabolism who may struggle with ketogenic or carnivore diets. But the rest of us, no matter what your genes are, you're probably going to thrive on this diet and don't believe the hype about why you should not do it because you have an APOE4 polymorphism or because your LDL goes sky high. So, all right, you guys, stay radical. Stay radical.